Good afternoon, everyone. It will take just a few seconds for everyone to come into the webinar, and we'll begin shortly. Good afternoon and welcome to the Humanities Forum. My name is Raymond Hain and I'm a member of the philosophy department here at Providence College and the director of the forum. The Humanities Forum now in its sixth year exists to provide a regular space on campus for the entire college community to reflect on some of the deepest human things. We host guests from on and off campus and include artistic performances, lectures, panel discussions, debates, and film screenings. This year has, of course, been an unusual one for us as we moved all of our events to an online webinar format. Nevertheless, we've had a great year, and I extend my thanks to all of you who have joined us and are with us again this afternoon for our concluding guest. It's my pleasure now to introduce today's event, part of this semester's special collaboration between the Forum and the Frederick Douglass Project here at PC, made possible in part by the generous support of the Jack Miller Center. The host of today's forum is Professor Ian Bernhoft, a member of the Providence College English Department and the organizer of the Frederick Douglass Project. Today's guest is the last of three special guests hosted by the forum this spring in connection with the Frederick Douglass Project. As a reminder, today's presentation and discussion will be recorded and made available on our website early next week. Thank you again for joining us this afternoon. And I turn things over now to Professor Bernhoft who will introduce our guest. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for joining us today. Um, today, we have the pleasure of speaking with Professor Diana Schaub, who's a professor of political science at Loyola University in Maryland. Um, professor Schaub has written books on Montesquieu and uh, co-edited a, a collection titled What So Proudly We Hail, The American Soul in Story, Speech, and Song. And she's held positions at Princeton and at Harvard University. Um, she, her, in recent years, her work has focused particularly on American political thought and history, um, including Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass, whom she'll be focusing on today, and more generally on African American political thought and the relevance of core American ideals to contemporary challenges and debates. Her writing appears in outlets such as the Wall Street Journal, the Weekly Standard, the Claremont Review of Books and elsewhere. Professor Schaub holds her PhD and MA from the University of Chicago and as a graduate of Canyon College. And today she will be speaking on learning to love Lincoln, Frederick Douglass's journey from grievance to gratitude. And I know I'm especially excited to hear from Pro Professor Schaub because I think she'll be speaking on one of my favorite works of Douglass, which is his oration in memory of Abraham Lincoln. And I should note, before we turn things over, two practical matters. One is that throughout the presentation, throughout Professor Schaub's presentation and our conversation, the question box is open for you to be asking questions. And at the end of our conversation today, so shortly after four o'clock, we'll be announcing the winners of the Frederick Douglass Essay and Public Speaking Contest, which I believe some of you in attendance have submitted work to. So with all that being said, I'm going to mute my microphone and turn the floor over to Professor Diana Schaub. Great, thank you, Ian. Um, as Ian mentioned, uh, my text for this afternoon will be Frederick Douglass's uh, 1876 oration in memory of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, it's a speech that presents Douglas's assessment of Lincoln's character and statesmanship. These are matters over which there is still much contention. Uh, the recent 1619 project, for instance, takes a strongly anti-Lincoln line. Um, now, perhaps this should not be surprising. Uh, after all, there was never much appreciation of Lincoln from the radical wing of his own party during his administration. Radicals then and now have been particularly stinting in their praise of Lincoln. Some today suggest that the credit for emancipation belongs to those like Frederick Douglass who pressured Lincoln to take that decisive step. 
Uh, at the extreme, this position asserts that Lincoln was actually anti-Black, uh, that the Emancipation Proclamation was basically a fraud, uh, and that Lincoln does not deserve any credit since he was forced into glory. However, before signing on to that radical critique, we might want to examine what the greatest of the abolitionists himself had to say about Lincoln. Uh, from his newspaper editorials before and during the war to his speeches and personal reminiscences after the war, the trajectory of Frederick Douglass's thinking about Lincoln is one of increasing and deepening appreciation, uh, often revising his own earlier negative assessments. Uh, perhaps because Douglas was self-educated, he remained a lifelong learner capable of this kind of open-minded and rigorous reconsideration. Uh, the way in which his uh, exercise of his critical faculties could lead him to substantive revaluations was evident early in his career when he dramatically changed his opinion about the status of slavery under the Constitution. Uh, he had at first joined fellow abolitionists in viewing the Constitution as a pro-slavery document, but he came to see that that interpretation was grossly mistaken. And in 1851, Douglas embraced an anti-slavery reading of the Constitution and thereby transformed himself from a revolutionary intent on annulling the Constitution to a reformer, still fiercely critical of American failures, but ever after a staunch defender of America's founding principles. I think that a parallel but more subtle shift occurred as a result of Douglas's encounter with Lincoln. That encounter taught him to appreciate the statesman, uh, which is to say the prudent politician, uh, as well as to appreciate the John Browns of the world. So Douglas learned to love Lincoln, and in that 1876 oration in memory of Lincoln, he recapitulated that intellectual and emotional journey for the benefit of all Americans. Douglas's oration uh, was delivered as the keynote address uh, at the unveiling of the nation's first ever statue in honor of Lincoln. Uh, the statue is entitled simply Emancipation and it was erected in the name of the former slaves and it was paid for entirely by their donations. The funds were raised just pennies and nickels at a time. Uh, Douglas's speech uh, given on this ceremonial occasion uh, expressed gratitude toward Lincoln. But more intriguingly, it reflected on the political significance of gratitude. So it's a speech both of gratitude and about gratitude. Douglas says, the sentiment of gratitude, which perpetuates the memories of great public men, is one of the noblest that can stir and thrill the human heart. And he points out uh, that with the dedication of this Freedmen's Memorial, Black Americans now, for the first time, he says, in the history of our people, join in this high worship. Douglas wants the world to notice what, quote, we, the colored people, are doing in honoring Abraham Lincoln. As he explains, first things are always interesting, and this is one of our first things. Douglas presents the Black commemoration of Lincoln as an act that honors the honorers almost as much as it honors the honoree. Uh, I wanna give you just a little bit of background uh, on this uh, Freedmen's Memorial uh, before we turn to the analysis of the text. Uh, and uh, it's a very interesting story uh, how, uh, how the uh, first national act, uh, what that was called the first national act uh, of black Americans came off well. Uh, it's, it's quite a story. Uh, Douglas was asked in 1865 to lend his name to the Educational Monument Association. Uh, this association proposed to raise money from blacks and whites to build a black college in honor of Lincoln's memory. Douglas refused to participate in the project. Uh, and here's what he wrote in his letter to the organizers. For a monument by itself and upon its own merits, I say good. For a college by itself and upon its own merits, I say good. But for a college monument or a monument college, I do not say good. The whole scheme is derogatory to the character of the colored people of the United States. It looks to me like an attempt to wash the black man's face in the nation's tears for Abraham Lincoln. I am for washing the black man's face, that is educating his mind, for that is a good thing to be done. And I appreciate the nation's tears for Abraham Lincoln. But I'm not so enterprising as to think of turning the nation's veneration for our martyred president into a means of advantage to the colored people and of sending around the hat to a 
morning public. Uh, so Douglas doesn't want gratitude to be contaminated with blatant self-interest because gratitude isn't really gratitude then. In this proposed college monument, the problem of impure or contaminated motives would have been even worse since there would not just be a mixture of motives, but actually a division of motives along racial lines. Whites would be doing the giving, the creditable giving, and blacks would be doing the taking, the self-interested taking. Douglas does not want his people to enter upon citizenship in that way. Now, this is not to say that Douglas was in principle opposed to philanthropy. Um, even white philanthropy on behalf of blacks. Uh, years earlier, he had set the plan for a college, an industrial college, in answer to an inquiry from Harriet Beecher Stowe about what she could do to contribute to black advancement. However, Douglas was always sensitive to the dangers of ill time, of overly intrusive assistance. Um, he thought it could have the perverse effect of sapping black initiative and thereby actually impeding the, the long-term prospects of the race. So Douglas worried that there was always more of benevolence and pity rather than straightforward justice in white America's dealings with blacks. And his preference was for justice, sternly, blindly equal, with no special pleadings or privileges. This leads uh, to what at first might seem a contradiction in Douglas's reaction to the Monument College project. Uh, I think it's pretty well known uh, that Douglas's vision of America was fundamentally integrationist. Nonetheless, he wants the monument to be exclusively a Black effort. Uh, he says, however humble it, it is, it should be our own act and deed. On the other hand, when it comes to the idea of the college, Douglas speaks against not only the self-serving hybrid of a monument college, but also against the idea of any college being built for the permanent and exclusive use of Black Americans. Now, given the discrimination of the day, Douglas uh, acknowledged that there was a temporary need for what he called complexional institutions. But he didn't want to see the building of any institution that accepted the permanence of segregation. Uh, as he said, the American people must stand each for all and all for each without respect to color or race. So he's in favor of a separately erected monument by Blacks, but opposed to a separate college. Why a Freedmen's Memorial and not a Freedmen's College? What accounts for his different judgment of these two endeavors? The explanation, I think, hinges on the nature of the two undertakings uh, and their potential contribution to either lessening racial prejudice or prolonging the time of racial prejudice. A display of gratitude towards Lincoln by Black Americans would undercut white prejudice by showing Blacks to be capable of these holiest sentiments of the human heart. Conversely, a college explicitly and exclusively reserved for Blacks, whoever ends up paying for it, by accommodating race prejudice might bolster that prejudice. So Douglas accepts all black institutions only with great reluctance and always with this proviso that as soon as circumstances permit, uh, African-Americans should make their way into the majority institutions. So I think Douglas is consistent uh, in that he judges instances of racial solidarity or instances of group action by their ultimate effects on friendship between the races. So his guiding question is always, does the doing of this deed point us towards the overcoming of race prejudice uh, and contribute to an ethos of common citizenship? Uh, acts of Black self-reliance, whether they're individual or group-based, can create the conditions for non-racial brotherhood. Uh, Douglas understood that before the Black man could be recognized as a Brother, you must be recognized as a man. Manliness precedes fraternity. Or uh, if we want to give this a non-gendered formulation, independence precedes friendship. Uh, it, 
As it turned out, uh, the Monument College plan was abandoned, uh, maybe because Douglas refused to get behind it. Uh, in the end, the memorial took the pure form that he wanted, uh, and Douglas himself delivered the keynote address. Not surprisingly, the first paragraph of his address refers to the manly pride with which Black should view the occasion. And the final paragraph sets forth the Black claim to human brotherhood. Uh, in between that opening invocation of manliness or independence and the closing invocation of brotherhood or friendship, the speech itself demonstrates how a still very divided nation could develop a shared perspective on the achievements of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, we're almost ready to get started on the commentary on the address itself, but I want to say one more um, element about the background. Um, any analysis of the speech, I think, has to take into account not only the uniqueness of the occasion, but the rhetorical dilemma posed by the larger historical moment. Remember, the speech is given in 1876. Reconstruction period is coming to an end. The federal government is increasingly reluctant to enforce the 14th and 15th Amendments to the Constitution. Douglas was very worried about the resurgent spirit of the Old South. And he worried that reconciliation between Northern whites and Southern whites could end up excluding African Americans, excluding the freedmen. And thereby erasing the real meaning of the Civil War. So he attempts to use the memory of Lincoln to counteract this dangerous tendency. He wants to revive uh, the new birth of freedom that Lincoln spoke of in the Gettysburg Address. All right, now the oration itself. Um, it has a very careful structure. It's composed of eight distinct sections and each of these sections begins with what grammarians call a vocative expression, a direct address to the audience. In the first two sections, he addresses friends and fellow citizens. In the subsequent six sections, simply fellow citizens. Now, politicians often rely on direct address of this sort. Uh, sometimes it becomes a kind of verbal tick. Uh, you know, think about uh, Lyndon Johnson uh, in his Texas accent, which I cannot imitate. Uh, he peppered all of his speeches with, you know, my fellow Americans. Douglas's repetitions, though, of this phrase, uh, fellow citizens or friends and fellow citizens, uh, I think his repetitions are more deliberate. They signal new phases of his argument, an argument that delineates the different but not irreconcilable claims of both whites and blacks to the memory of Lincoln. Douglas begins the oration by addressing his immediate audience. Um, the immediate audience was those who assembled that day in Lincoln Park, due east of the Capitol building on the 11th anniversary of Lincoln's assassination. Uh, the audience was a large one and very racially mixed, uh, about 25,000 ordinary citizens. Uh, there were lots of members of official Washington who were present, uh, including uh, members of the House of Representatives, the Senate, uh, the presence of the Chief Justice, and every single member of the Supreme Court, and President Grant himself. Those attendees deserve to be called not just fellow citizens, but friends. The very fact of their attendance gives evidence of their sympathies. Interestingly, though, the first section of the speech doesn't make any mention at all of Lincoln. It instead congratulates you, a pronoun that seems to refer, at least initially, only to Douglas's fellow Blacks. So he speaks of things like our condition as a people, referring to African Americans. Uh, referring to the progress in their condition. That evidence of progress, Douglas says, is a credit to American civilization. And that phrase seems to provide the occasion for a shift from congratulating you, his fellow Blacks, to congratulating all. Douglas notes that this new dispensation of freedom has come to both our fellow, our, oh, sorry, our white fellow citizens and ourselves. The second section of the speech uh, acknowledges especially the federal government and the friendly role it has played in this new dispensation. The erection of the memorial received congressional approval 
Uh, the statue was paid for by African Americans, but the pedestal for the statue was paid for by Congress. And in fact, the day itself had been declared a federal holiday, the day of the unveiling. Douglas, what Douglas chooses to cite uh, here is the awful sacrifice that lies behind this federal friendship for African Americans. The section contains Douglas's first mention of Lincoln, and he calls Lincoln the first martyr president of the United States. Moreover, Lincoln's martyrdom is presented as the climax of the larger national sacrifice to which Douglas now alludes with his reference to yonder heights of Arlington. Arlington Cemetery was visible from Lincoln Park and 16,000 Civil War soldiers were buried there, including 1,500 Black troops. On the 11th anniversary of Lincoln's death, what Douglas wanted to remind his audience of was blood bought freedom, our blood bought freedom in which we, the colored people rejoice. While Douglas emphasizes the sentiment of appreciation that gives rise to monuments, like this one being unveiled, curiously, he says next to nothing about the actual statue. It's known that he was not altogether pleased with the design. Uh, and Ian, I think at this point, you've got a, uh, a photo of the statue that you can share with the audience here. So you yeah, can, can see you. the statue itself there. So the design shows Lincoln, uh, Emancipation Proclamation in one hand, standing over a crouching or half rising figure of a slave. Uh, I hope that maybe in the, in the question period we'll have a chance to talk a little bit more about the statue itself uh, and your, maybe your reactions to it. Uh, now, dissatisfaction with the sculpture was not limited to Douglas. Uh, it was apparently shared by other African Americans. And the official program for the festivities attempted to address these objections. Uh, there's a paragraph in the program that says, quote, in the original design, the kneeling slave was represented as perfectly passive, receiving freedom from the hand of the great liberator. But the artist justly changed this to bring the presentation nearer to the historical fact by making the emancipated slave an agent in his own deliverance. He is accordingly represented as exerting his own strength with strained muscles in breaking the chain which had bound him. The brochure goes on to mention that there was an alternative design uh, by a female sculptor, Harriet Hosmer. It had to be rejected as too costly, but that design would have depicted Lincoln atop a central pillar flanked by an array of smaller pillars showing, among other figures, Black Union soldiers. I think it's pretty obvious that Douglas would have preferred that design. Uh, that design, the Hosmer design, embodied his favorite aphorism. Uh, this is a line of poetry from Lord Byron that he cited in, uh, you know, a, a dozen uh, at least of his addresses. Let me just read it to you. Hereditary bondsmen, know ye not, who would be free themselves must strike the blow. In a sense, uh, I think one could argue that Douglas's speech corrects the submissiveness or the paternalism of the statue, because Douglas's speech acknowledges both our loyal, brave, and patriotic soldiers and the vast, high, and preeminent services rendered to ourselves, to our race, to our country, and to the whole world by Abraham Lincoln. In other words, Douglas's praise of Lincoln is balanced by his recognition of Black agency the invaluable contribution made by those Black Union troops. Uh, and remember, by the end of the Civil War, there were 180,000 Black troops. All right, um, Ian, I think if you want to um, stop the screen share there, we can maybe put the statue back up again uh, uh, during the discussion period. All right, so uh, we talked about the first two sections. Um, let's go now to the third section. Uh, and it's in the third section that Douglas begins to speak to the larger nationwide audience. Uh, this is an audience of fellow citizens 
not all of whom are necessarily friends. Douglas now treads very carefully. He does not want the black embrace of Lincoln to trigger a white flight from Lincoln. And so he quite dramatically backs away from the great emancipator. And he insists, quote, Abraham Lincoln was not in the fullest sense of the word, either our man or our model in his interests, in his associations, in his habits of thought and in his prejudices. He was a white man. He was preeminently the white man's president, entirely devoted to the welfare of white men. He was ready and willing at any time during the last years of his administration to deny, postpone, and sacrifice the rights of humanity in the colored people to promote the welfare of the white people of his country. The race to which we belong were not the special objects of his consideration. Knowing this, I concede to you, my white fellow citizens, a preeminence in this worship at once full and supreme. You are the children of Abraham Lincoln. Douglas devotes the whole of section three to reassuring nervous whites, whites who are patriotic, but probably prejudiced. Basically, he tells them, look, don't worry. Lincoln always loved you best. Take it from me, a Negro. Lincoln was not a Negro lover. It's a rather sovereign rhetorical gambit, but it allowed Douglas to exhort white Americans to heap high their hosannas of Lincoln. He tells them, to you, it especially belongs to sound his praises, to preserve and perpetuate his memory, to multiply his statues, to hang his pictures on your walls and commend his example. For to you, he was a great and glorious friend and benefactor. By the close of this third section of the speech, uh, which we might dub the white supremacist section, one might wonder why blacks are bothering to honor Lincoln at all. Douglas's answer is that while whites are Lincoln's children, blacks are his stepchildren, children by adoption, children by force of circumstance and necessity. Moreover, what Lincoln did for his stepchildren whether it was part of his original intention or not, was deliver them from bondage. Accordingly, Douglas entreats whites to despise not the humble offering of former slaves. The separate claims of whites and blacks upon the memory of Lincoln can coexist. Whites can honor Lincoln for saving the Union. Blacks can honor him for emancipation. Shared appreciation, shared homage, if it is ever to develop, must begin with toleration for racially specific homage. Uh, Frederick Douglass had a gift for metaphor, and I think this image of Blacks as Lincoln's stepchildren is one of his best. It accords actually very nicely with Lincoln's own account of the relationship between the cause of union and the cause of emancipation. Uh, there's a very famous letter that Lincoln wrote to Horace Greeley, a newspaper editor. And uh, in that letter, Lincoln explains his duty as president. Uh, Lincoln says, quote, my paramount object in this struggle is to save the union. And it is not either to save or to destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. If I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. Douglas reminds his listeners that Lincoln was a unionist first and foremost and that he became the great emancipator only by force of circumstances and necessity. Whites ought to revere, revere uh, Lincoln as the savior of the nation. And indeed the inscription on the national Lincoln Memorial, which was built a half a century after the Freedmen's Memorial reads, quote, in this temple as in the hearts of the people for whom he saved the union, the memory of Abraham Lincoln is enshrined forever. Now, it has to be pointed out, uh, the union to which Lincoln was devoted had at its foundation the principle 
of human equality. So as Lincoln understood it, the union itself was a moral project. Because the bond of genuine union is a teaching about natural right, American patriotism ought to produce citizens who are, as Douglas says, friendly to the freedom of all men. In the fourth and central section of the speech, Douglas presents at greater length the stepchildren's view of Lincoln. And he says the essential feature of their view was faith in Lincoln's living and earnest sympathy with their fate. But again, Douglas doesn't paper over the disagreements, the disappointments that Blacks experienced during the war years. We were, he admits, at times stunned grieved and greatly bewildered. Uh, he gives a whole litany of reasons why Blacks might have doubted Lincoln's goodwill. Uh, Lincoln supported colonization schemes. He initially refused to enlist Black troops. Uh, after he allowed Black recruitment, he refused to retaliate when the Confederates violated the rules of warfare by massacring Black prisoners uh, of war. Uh, and uh, Lincoln revoked uh, some early emancipation decrees by Union generals in the field. Nevertheless, Douglas asserts that, quote, we were able to take a comprehensive view of Abraham Lincoln, uh, a view that took the measure of the man, and after factoring in the logic of events, Douglas says we came to the conclusion that the hour and the man of our redemption had met in the person of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Douglas then gives a counter wisdom of the liberationist, racially transformative policies that transpired under Lincoln's rule. Uh, he lists nine achievements uh, culminating in the Emancipation Proclamation. And each time, with each achievement, he repeats a version of the phrase, under his rule we saw. I think that phrase is crucial for both Blacks and whites. Blacks, who had always longed for liberty, but who might understandably be very suspicious of rule and law since they had suffered under generations of misrule, Douglas reminds Blacks that their liberty came to them through law and through wise and beneficent rule. Conversely, whites are reminded that the actions of Lincoln, uh, which struck not only uh, against slavery, but also um, help to tear down prejudice and proscription. Those were the actions of a dedicated constitutionalist. So the closing paragraph then of section four celebrates emancipation and shows that that celebration can be shared by all. Douglas asks, can any colored man or any white man friendly to the freedom of all men ever forget the night which followed the first day of January 1863, the day the Emancipation Proclamation took effect? So whites can appreciate black liberation and blacks can appreciate white statesmanship. This is a word that Douglas now uses for the first but not the last time in the address. On this new biracial basis of union and liberty, Douglas goes on to a reconsideration of Lincoln in sections five, six, and seven. Um, um, hey, let's see, how are we doing on time here? Um, let me skip, skip forward just a, a little bit, not talk about each of these, but let me just give you uh, what I think is a crucial passage. Um, remember, we looked earlier at the white supremacist passage uh, about Lincoln in section uh, three. Now, Douglas in section five revises that account and he reconsiders Lincoln's deference to popular prejudice in the appropriate context, the context of democratic statesmanship. Here's what he says at the close of section five. Uh, it's a fairly long passage. I have said that President Lincoln was a white man and shared the prejudices common to his countrymen towards the colored race. Looking back to his times and to the condition of his country, that unfriendly feeling on his part may safely be set down as one element of his wonderful success in organizing the loyal American people for the tremendous conflict before them and bringing them safely through that conflict. His great mission was to accomplish two things. First, to save his country from dismemberment and ruin. And second, to free his country from the great crime of slavery. 
to do one or the other or both. He must have the earnest sympathy and the powerful cooperation of his loyal fellow countrymen. Without that primary and essential condition to success, his efforts must have been vain and utterly fruitless. Had he put the abolition of slavery before the salvation of the Union, he would have inevitably driven from him a powerful class of the American people and rendered resistance to rebellion impossible. Viewed from the genuine abolition ground, Mr. Lincoln seemed tardy, cold, dull, and indifferent. But measuring him by the sentiment of his country, a country he was bound as a statesman to consult, he was swift, zealous, radical, and determined. Now, we need to remember Frederick Douglass himself always occupied the genuine abolition ground. Uh, and his speeches and writings from the early years of the war, especially, often manifested great frustration with Lincoln's caution. In retrospect, though, 10 years after the war, Douglas generously acknowledges the partiality, the limitedness of his own abolitionist stance, and he credits Lincoln as the comprehensive statesman. Uh, so I think Douglas is really trying to model what it looks like to take a comprehensive view of a politician. Uh, his people are new voters, uh, and there are two dangers that they have to avoid. Douglas does not want Blacks looking to politics for a Moses figure, but he doesn't want them to fall into the opposite error of cynically seeing only flaws. And so he shows the possibility of appreciation without idolatry and criticism without rejection. Um, now, um, just a um, couple of more points here. Um, just as he has revisited um, Lincoln's deference to public opinion, uh, he now revisits another issue as well. Uh, In section three, when he mentioned Lincoln's policy of opposition to the extension of slavery, he stressed Lincoln's willingness to protect, defend, and perpetuate slavery in the slave states. And in section three, that tolerance of slavery in the South was cited as evidence of Lincoln's pro-white views. But now in section five, Douglas explains that Lincoln acted as he did, not because he was indifferent to the fate of black slaves, but quote, because he thought it was so nominated in the bond, uh, meaning the bond of the Constitution, the words of the Constitution. Uh, Lincoln acted out of fidelity to the Constitution. So Lincoln's pre-war willingness to leave slavery alone in the Southern states does not in any way disprove or lessen his anti-slavery convictions. Now, Douglas actually disagreed with Lincoln about what precisely was nominated in the bond. Um, in other words, they disagreed a little bit about those constitutional clauses, uh, particularly the Fugitive Slave Clause. Um, but nonetheless, Douglas, especially after the war, wants to move his audience toward an appreciation of constitutional devotion. He is acutely aware that racial progress in the future will depend upon the fidelity of both blacks and whites to the constitution. Uh, the constitution is purified and completed by the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments. Uh, interestingly, uh, after the various mentions of race in previous sections, by the time he gets to section six and seven, as the speech is winding down, uh, Douglas transcends race altogether. He, in fact, makes no further reference uh, uh, in those two sections to either Blacks or whites. Uh, he has, in a way, shown a, a way forward uh, towards a, um, a, a biracial union and biracial appreciation of Lincoln. Uh, the final section of the speech, uh, section eight, is just one paragraph in length. Uh, and you could say there what Douglas does is to come full circle. And there at the end, he does speak once again to his largely black audience. 
uh, and he tells them in doing honor to the memory of our friend and liberator, we have been doing highest honor to ourselves and those who come after us. Note that despite the unfriendly feeling that Douglas had ascribed to Lincoln in sections three and five, by the end of the speech, he refers to Lincoln as our friend. Uh, so through this presentation of Lincoln's statesmanship, uh, Douglas has tried to knit together the American polity uh, in mutual understanding and appreciation of Lincoln. Uh, and I think in doing that, Douglas has acted as a statesman himself. He's trying to demonstrate how memory and memorialization, when we do that well, might shape a better American future. Uh, all right, I do want to leave time for uh, questions. So I, I think I'll stop uh, right there. Um, I, I do hope uh, kind of planting the notion here for uh, some questions. Uh, I would like a chance to talk a little bit more about, uh, about that statue and your reaction to it. Okay. Terrific. Um, okay. So one question, you know, that I would like to begin with is, um, and you touched on on how Douglas's understanding of Lincoln is is one that praises his prudence. And I'm wondering how you view the role of prudence in the positions that Douglas stakes out, because you know, with regards to the the way he changes his mind on slavery uh, in the constitution yeah. on the in, on the constitution in slavery, um, going from reading it as a a document that's this inexorably stained by slavery to this what he calls a glorious liberty document, whether that shift in interpretation is simply a prudential one. I don't know whether simply is the right word to use, mm -hmm. but um, I guess whether again, in, as he navigates this, this moment that you described in 1876 in reconstruction, how much of his own assessment of Lincoln is guided by his sense of what is the prudential stance to take on Lincoln? Yeah, good. Um, on his uh, change of mind about the Constitution, um, uh, I think there is clearly an element of sort of pragmatism or, or, uh, or prudence in that shift. Uh, in other words, he recognizes that the, um, the, the Garrisonian abolitionists uh, who were calling for annulling the Constitution weren't going to get very far because Americans revered their Constitution. Uh, and so they weren't going to get anywhere in calling for that kind of revolutionary uh, shift. Uh, so he did think it was much more prudent to be a reformer uh, rather than a revolutionary. Uh, but I also believe that that uh, change in interpretation was also truly sincere and honest. Uh, so he, he begins to recognize the pragmatic value of that changed interpretation in 1849, but he doesn't announce his change of opinion until 1851. And he actually spends two years studying the Constitution, studying uh, different theories about constitutional interpretation, uh, textual hermeneutics. Uh, I mean, he really delves into those, that question of how do you read a text? Uh, and it's only after he satisfies himself uh, that this is in fact the correct interpretation of the constitution that he announces this change of heart. So, you know, uh, a certain kind of pragmatism uh, might be able to, uh, uh, to practice a kind of dishonesty, but I, I don't think that true prudence does. Uh, so, so Douglas understands uh, prudence as, uh, as I think requiring, uh, requiring honesty. Um, uh, so then, you know, the second part of your question is about what does this mean about uh, about this speech? Uh, and I, I did try to stress this. This is a particular historical moment. And so, yes, he is deploying the memory of Lincoln uh, uh, and he may be choosing certain elements to emphasize uh, in order to get uh, that sort of use out of Lincoln's memory. And one way to illustrate this is to look at the difference between how he speaks about Lincoln in his autobiography um, and how he speaks about Lincoln here. So in the autobiography, uh, he's, he, he says very clearly that he, he when he was in Lincoln's company, 
Uh, he never felt that Lincoln was aware of race at all or racial difference. He says, I was never reminded of my unpopular color. Uh, he presents Lincoln as in, in fact, much better in this regard than many of the, you know, sort of most uh, progressive abolitionists uh, that he that he associated with. Uh, so it's odd that in this speech he 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 keeps sort of highlighting these elements of Lincoln's possible prejudice, and I think that what could account for that is that he knows that in fact most white Americans are prejudiced. But he wants to, to sketch a way forward despite that prejudice, or he wants to make the point that there can be racial progress even in light of that prejudice. Uh, and so he, he's, not, he's not just flip-flopping there, but he's choosing to highlight different elements of Lincoln's legacy. Uh, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and it's a good good corrective, especially with regards to the Constitution. This isn't a sort of fly-by-night strategic decision that it, it's brought out as a result of extensive intellectual investigation and study. Yeah. Uh, a couple of questions that are skewing slightly historically, but I, th but I think they're pertinent. Okay. One is um, an audience member asks, says, Douglas seems to have been very perceptive and how he sees Lincoln's devotion to the Constitution with regards to making change. But who exactly is Douglas's audience? Is he speaking just to educated Black men and women? Um, and I'm not sure whether the questioner is, is contradistincting the, the educated part or the Black part, but maybe you could speak towards Douglas's audience, both for the speech and, and in this moment. Yeah, yeah, good. Um, for this speech, um, Douglas was very aware that this was the largest audience and the most national audience he would ever have. Okay? Uh, this day was set aside as a federal holiday. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, President Grant, the Supreme Court, all of these members of official Washington were present. Uh, this speech would have been uh, reproduced. Uh, you know, uh, transcribed uh, a full a full uh, uh, text of this speech uh, in many, many newspapers throughout the land. Uh, it was also a speech at which a very large number of uh, Black Washington was present. Um, so actually the majority of the audience were Black Americans resident in Washington, D.C. Uh, and that audience would have been a mix of people who were already literate, uh, but many of them would not have been literate. And I think he was aware that the speech would probably have been read aloud uh, by those uh, blacks who were literate to uh, you know, gatherings of uh, African-Americans who were, who were not uh, all literate. Uh, so he was very aware that in this speech, he was speaking to, to whites, to blacks, uh, to friends, to enemies. <laughs> he, he, this is uh, the largest audience he will ever have. Uh, and so uh, that has a profound effect on the way he proceeds in this speech. So it's a different kind of speech than he would give, say, you know, before the war, where he would be speaking to an abolitionist audience, uh, you know, uh, preaching to the choir. Uh, and so it's a very different speech than a speech like his Fourth uh, of July oration. Uh, which many people may be familiar with. So as long as, since you mentioned that, one of the things that I'd particularly appreciate about your reading of the oration in memory of Abraham Lincoln is called attention to the way Douglas uses pronouns, right? Mm -hmm. Of yeah. of the we versus you, and he was yeah. uh, not our men. And then at, but at the end, you, as you said, he's he's our friend. And when, when we read What to the Slave is the Fourth of July earlier this semester, one of the things we noticed was how he sort of weaponizes pronouns in that speech, that it begins with, with what appears to be a, a national celebration, a national act, and then and this chasm opens between you and I. Like, what, what, what do you have? What does your holiday and your liberty and your independence say have to do with, with me? And um, so it seems like there's almost an, an opposite motion here. Instead of instead of a, a rending in two, there's a stitching together 
or unifying, which I I really liked the way you drew that out. Um, I realized as I get to the end of that sentence, it's not a question. It's merely a... Um, I mean, that that, that was, uh, yeah, really nice. Uh, and it, it certainly is true that in the 4th of July oration, you know, this is this is your 4th of July, you know, not mine. Uh, I'm excluded uh, from this day because, you know, my sympathies are with the slaves who are not included in this day. Uh, so, so, yeah, that's certainly true. But at the same time, in that 4th of July address, uh, he begins fellow citizens. Uh, and in fact, ever since the moment in which uh, Douglas announced he had changed his mind about the character of the Constitution, once he viewed the Constitution as an anti-slavery document, from that day forward, uh, he began his speeches by uh, addressing fellow citizens. Uh, in other words, he, he does insist on his own belonging. Uh, in that Fourth of July speech, even while highlighting, uh, you know, these this uh, this element of exclusion. So, in the Fourth of July speech, the way I see that one working, he begins with the praise, actually, of the Declaration and the founding generation. He ends with the praise of the Constitution, and between those two um, sections of praise is that great middle section, which is just the denunciation of the current generation of Americans. So, you know, they have betrayed the promise of the founding. So, you you know, in a way, what Douglas uh, does in that speech is to present himself as the natural son of the founders and, uh, you know, most white Americans as the, uh, you know, the... Uh, <laughs> the illegitimate uh, offspring of the of the founders. Yeah, or at least the the prodigal sons, anyway. Yeah, right? yeah, prodigal sons. Um, somebody, another audience member, and this this touches back to our what we were talking about previously with regards to uh, pragmatism and prudence. Mm -hmm. It's sometimes said the Emancipation Proclamation was strictly a military measure to help the Union's war efforts since solely slaves in the rebellious states were freed. On the one hand, can you comment on the constitutional, constitutional issues involved in the Emancipation Proclamation? On the other, did this interpretation of it factor into Douglas's own understanding of the Emancipation or of, of Lincoln? Uh, yes, it is certainly true that Lincoln justifies the Emancipation Proclamation as a military measure, uh, removing the manpower of uh, that slaves were providing to the South uh, and shifting that manpower uh, to the North, uh, especially by allowing uh, Blacks to then serve in the American military. Uh, Lincoln believed that that was the only thing that would make the Emancipation Proclamation legitimate. Uh, in other words, his understanding is that the federal government before the Civil War uh, had no uh, authorization to interfere with slavery in the slave states. The only thing that could make that constitutional uh, was uh, uh, something like this uh, gigantic uh, rebellion. Uh, so yes, the Emancipation Proclamation was a war measure and justified uh, in that way. Nonetheless, uh, Lincoln understood uh, that uh, uh, that its issuance, uh, particularly if the if the the Union then won the war, that it would lead to freedom across the board for all of the slaves, uh, and that very quickly became evident. I mean, once the Emancipation Proclamation was issued, uh, even though it did not touch slavery in the loyal border states like Maryland, Maryland moved immediately at that point to end slavery. Uh, and even though you know, Lincoln had pleaded with the Marylanders uh, to end slavery on their own uh, before issuing the Emancipation Proclamation, they refused to do it. But once the proclamation was issued, they, uh, they, they, uh, they immediately acted. Uh, so it, it did have uh, immediate and far reaching effects. Uh, I'm sorry, there was a second part of that question. Oh, about Douglas. Yeah, um, uh, uh, Douglas absolutely uh, welcomed uh, the issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation. He had been pushing for that uh, already. And um, from the issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation forward, he shows much more uh, appreciation of Lincoln uh, and becomes uh, willing to, you know, even tolerate, you know, his, his caution, which he hadn't had much toleration for before. 
Uh, but he, he, from that moment, he really sees that Lincoln is serious about this. It seems like in, in some of Douglas's writings on Lincoln from the early war years that, that I've read, what he really dreads is that Lincoln is going to compromise with, with the Southern whites and kind of deal with them. And that that's, you know, that's the direction his, his statesmanship will take him in. Yeah. And, 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 that, and that's why he was very disappointed in the first inaugural. Yeah. Uh, he thought it was, uh, there was too much appeasement in the, in the speech. Uh, I think he's sort of uh, a little bit wrong in that, um, in that assessment. I don't think there's as much appeasement there as he thinks, but. Yeah. You know, one thing that, I would I would love to hear you weigh in on is so something that stands out as exceptional about the this oration I think especially in contradistinction to contemporary politics is how you know you mentioned how this third section is a sort of a a white supremacist section and Douglas admits Lincoln was was neither our man nor our model and cata catalogs this this long litany of ways in which he he disappointed and yet he's He's willing to to work with him to and ultimately to embrace him and celebrate him. And I'm wondering, yeah. how, what would you what, what do you think Douglas would say about our contemporary push towards a sort of politics of purity, uh, you know, in, in this this sense of refusing to to do to compromise or work with people whose views in many respects we find abhorrent or beyond the pale. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really good question. Uh, um, you know, I mean, Douglas is is a radical. Uh, he's an activist. Uh, he he uh, he wants uh, progress. Uh, he wants action now. Uh, but at the same time, you see this tremendous nuance and balance. Uh, and and this speech in in particular really really models that. Um, yeah, so I, I think he's one of our greatest resources in this moment, uh, especially as, as we're trying to think about, uh, you know, statues and memorials and should we take them down, should we leave them and add historical context, should we move them to museums, you know, what, what should our attitude be? Uh, you know, I, I suspect that Douglas uh, would want every single Confederate memorial removed. And that's not, not, simply because of the connection between the Confederacy and slavery, but also because uh, the, the Confederates were, were traitorous, <laughs> treasonous. Uh, those statues don't have any business being on public lands or in public places. So I, uh, I think he would be pretty hard line about that, although I think he would want it to occur uh, legally and through public discussion and debate and decision. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I think he would uh, show uh, much more nuance in his evaluation of figures like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, uh, slaveholders themselves. Uh, but uh, especially given the way in which he speaks about the founding and the saving principles of the founding, he believes that the founding was in its thrust anti-slavery. Uh, and so you would need to look very carefully at, you know, how did each of these individuals acquit themselves? Uh, and that requires, uh, you know, in-depth historical analysis uh, to come to an, uh, to an assessment of whether they, whether they pass muster or not. Um, and, and, and those decisions are really complicated. Uh, so you can take somebody like Roger Tawney, who authored the Dred Scott decision, uh, he actually um, freed himself from slaveholding. He didn't want to be a slaveholder. Uh, and yet he then goes on to, you know, author this, this just, you know, egregious uh, decision, the, the worst decision in the history of the court. Uh, so what should you do about a figure like Roger Taney? Uh, the state of Maryland had a, a statue to him. Remember, he was chief justice for 35 years. You know, his, his legacy is not simply Dred Scott. Uh, there are uh, other elements of his legacy, should that statue be left there or not? Uh, interestingly, the descendants of Dred Scott weighed in on this, uh, and they actually argued for retaining the statue because they thought it's important that people understand the Dred Scott decision, and they wanted a, um, a kind of uh, a statue of Dred Scott to be erected, to be put into conversation with the Tawny statue, uh, and then, you know, various plaques and uh, historical background added. Uh, that was not the path that was taken. Uh, the Tawny statue was was removed uh, from the state house grounds. 
Um, I know we're, we're getting towards the end of the hour. Um, I guess, am I lagging or is this? Uh, uh, you froze just a little bit. Uh-oh. Um, <laughs> this might be a sign that it's a good place to cut off the recording then. Um, I'm just, those of you who are in the audience though, and uh, Professor Shab, just because I'm ending the recording uh, does not mean we'll, we'll end speaking. But could I just say one? I mean, do we have a, yes. just one or two minutes to say something about the the Freedmen's Memorial, since that statue has also been targeted? Yeah, please do. Yeah, yeah. I, I just want to uh, encourage uh, everyone to take another look at it. Uh, uh, I think there are some serious uh, reasons to to preserve this scriptural, uh, uh, sorry, uh, sculptural uh, tribute to to Lincoln. Um, you know, the fact that the funds were raised entirely by the newly freed people, uh, the fact that Douglas delivered this most significant oration there, uh, the fact that Douglas called that act uh, his people's first national act. Um, all of those, I think, are good reasons to preserve it. Uh, the objections to the statue are that it is, quote, visually irredeemable. Now, that's a pretty harsh thing to say about a, about a, a statue. I mean, uh, you know, sculpture is a visual medium. Uh, if it's truly visually irredeemable, uh, then maybe we can't defend this statue. But I want to suggest that we can. Um, the grouping is called emancipation. Uh, in other words, it's not a depiction of freedom. It's a depiction of the transition to freedom. And that change of status was made possible by Lincoln's executive order. And I think the statue captures something true about that in-between state. In other words, the freed man is not yet a free man. And not, in other words, not yet a free man in full. And I think that's why he's depicted as neither kneeling nor fully standing. He's in a half-risen posture. He's poised on the brink of possibility. The statue acknowledges that emancipation by law is just the beginning point. It's going to be an arduous journey. And note also, the figure of the slave is not looking up at Lincoln, not beseeching Lincoln. He's not looking at Lincoln at all. He's not a supplicant. His gaze is fixed forward, uh, eyes on the prize, you might say. Um, he sees the vast future for himself and his people. Uh, so I think those elements of Black agency are there in the statue. Now, there are some other elements that should be noted too. Uh, Lincoln's hand here is on a plinth. You can see the picture of uh, George Washington on the plinth. Uh, in other words, there's a, the, the plinth is a kind of representation of law, government, and the nation's founding. Behind Lincoln, which you can't see from this perspective, is a whipping post that is covered over in drapery. The artist presents both a reminder of the past and this promise of the future. An enslaved people lived under the lash, but a free people will live under the law. And in moving from one to the other, you don't forget about the horrors of the past or its lingering legacy. And I think that the statue, to the extent that sculpture can capture this, I think the statue tries to be honest about that. In celebrating the new birth of freedom, you don't deny the nation's injustice. Right? And so that is now represented as sort of behind, uh, behind uh, Lincoln there. Uh, also, the chain on the slave has been broken, but the cuffs still remain on his wrists. So this new order of the law allows for the freedman to rise, but the effort to wrench himself free right, and escape those constraints, that's still ongoing. And his clenched fist, the straining muscles, right, they all represent that. Uh, and then just one final point, and that's the figure of Lincoln. Um, rule of law is good and right, right? Uh, but the life of Lincoln shows that good individuals, wise leadership, are maybe the ultimate source of good law. And Douglas, of course, emphasized that in his oration when he listed those nine achievements of, of Lincoln's administration. Um, so I think there's an awful lot here to mull over in the statue, and maybe we just need to become better, um, you know, better appreciators of sculpture and how to read sculpture 
uh, before we just, you know, tear, tear them all down or <laughs> uh, consign them all to the to the museums. That's a those are some terrific points because it it at first glance it resembles this sort of white savior scooping down to lift up the the subservient man, but on closer inspection, that that doesn't necessarily. Yeah, hold I, mean, up. I do understand one's kind of instant reaction, maybe against the against the statue, but that in a way gets at something interesting about gratitude. Um, you know, in a democracy where we value equality, uh, gratitude actually makes us uncomfortable, perhaps, uh, because it does suggest uh, disproportion, uh, obligation. All right. Well, sorry, thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, Ian. I know you want to wrap this up. Go ahead. No, I, I don't want to wrap this up. I I think I I ought to I ought to stop the recording when there's a good moment. So okay. Um, but don't don't sign off. Though. We're going to stick around okay. for a second. Okay. But I will I will end the recording here with uh, many warm thanks to Professor Shaw for her wonderful presentation today.